very much, uh, all of you, for coming to this uh, annual event, uh, the Light Hill Lecture. Uh, perhaps the uh, most important focal point of all of us in the Kansas uh, Imperial. I think uh, today's Light Hill Lecture will be rather special because, uh, because as you know, uh, Light Hill started uh, a lot of the uh, biological uh, fluids work uh, at Imperial. Uh, Tim Bedley, who will give a lot of facts at the end, uh, worked with him then and probably tell some stories about that time and worked on that with the camp as well. And today's speaker uh, has done a lot of work on uh, uh, biological physics uh, involving uh, fluid mechanics. Uh, so today's speaker, Ray uh, Goldstein, uh, did his undergraduate studies in uh, physics and chemistry at MIT and uh, uh, got his PhD in theoretical physics from Cornell. Uh, then he had a number of positions, uh, I think it's Princeton, Chicago, Princeton, Arizona, and uh, eventually became a Schlumberger professor of applied mathematics, or of mathematics, I'm sorry because they've been this wrong, uh, in Downton, Cambridge. Uh, he, he, I, I, he agreed with me when I said I could describe him as a statistical, statistical physicist who often deals with problems where he's, uh, he finds himself against uh, food mechanics issues to deal with. Uh, his work has been uh, very highly recognized, uh, quite a number of prizes, including the Ig Nobel Prize for understanding uh, ponytails, but also the uh, uh, Bachelor Prize of Mechanics, and I think the Rosalind uh, Franklin Prize of the Institute of Physics, plus recently a fellowship for the Royal Society. Uh, so I'm very uh, happy to introduce you, uh, Greg Austin, and today's lecture, to Dynamics and the Schedule Itself. Well, certainly, thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to be here. And, uh, you know, sometimes people clap before the talk, but I hope I earn a clap at the end. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, I want to talk today about problems in fluid mechanics at the scale of the cell, but that's a pretty broad title, and my abstract was pretty vague about what I was going to discuss. So I thought I should uh, narrow it down a little bit, and I'm going to talk about synchronization of cilia. So cilia are those hair-like appendages that are all throughout your body, in the back of your brain, in your reproductive system, in your lungs, always pushing fluid around. And they're also the kinds of things that power motility in microorganisms. And I'm going to tell you a kind of detective story today about how we've come to understand through experiment and theory the mechanisms by which cilia coordinate their motion in large groups, as we, as we often find them. But I want to preface my comments by telling you just a little anecdote. Uh, this is an audience of mostly fluid dynamicists, although I did spot a string theorist back there. Um, but uh, some years ago, I was, I was visiting a, what I shall keep as an unnamed major North American university. And I was talking to a person who was not in my field. He was actually an astrophysicist. And he asked me what I did. And I said, well, I work a lot on biological fluid mechanics. And he looked me in the eye and he said, is fluid mechanics important for biology? And I really didn't know what to say because I thought of reminding him of his heart or his lungs or, or many other parts of his body that wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't work without the motion of fluids. And I thought about it for years, and then I remembered Leonardo. And this is how to answer the astrophysicist who wasn't sure about whether fluid mechanics was important for biology. So let me explain. So you've all seen Leonardo's Vitruvian Man from the late 1400s a million times. And we all love it because it's a celebration of the proportions of the human body the fact that our wingspan is about the same as our height. And we have, to a very good approximation, as I look around the room, bilateral symmetry, at least on the outside. But if you look underneath the skin, you'll remember, or I'm telling you, that things are not symmetric. That is, nearly all of you, probably all of you, have your heart on the left-hand side of your body. Please raise your hand, either hand, if you have your heart on the other side. Some people do. Some people have their entire body plan flipped and they're perfectly fine. But some people have a jumble of organs, some where they should be and some on the other side, and they're not perfectly fine. And the understanding of the mechanism by which this bilateral symmetry is broken in the developing vertebrate embryo is one of the great stories in biology in the last 15 years or so. So we all have at least three broken symmetries, top, bottom, front, back, left, right. And in early embryogenesis, it's the left-right symmetry that's the last to break. And what was understood starting a few years ago is that this is a problem involving fluid mechanics. So on the left, I have an electron micrograph of a mouse-to-be. 
And there's a little chamber here called Henson's node in the mouse, but more generally called the left-right organizer in vertebrates. It's a couple hundred microns across, tens of microns deep, with a membrane on top. And all throughout the base of the tissue in that chamber are cells which have cilia, which you see in a high-speed movie there, slowed down a lot. These are several micron long hair-like appendages that whirl around in a characteristic fashion. And in doing so, they set up a characteristic chiral fluid flow inside that chamber that in a way that's still a bit mysterious, interacts with chemical messengers on either side of the chamber to break the left-right symmetry of the developing embryo. And we know that's true because the experimentalists who discovered this mechanically went in, took the top off the chamber, stirred the fluid the other way, and the mouse ended up with its heart on the other side. Okay? And if that doesn't tell you that fluid mechanics is important for biology, I'm done. <laughs> okay, so now cilia and flagella, which I'll, the terms I'll use interchangeably, are found all throughout the animal and even the vegetable world. Uh, and uh, this is a graph which is intended to show you that they're also important in an issue in evolutionary biology, not just physiology, but evolutionary biology, which is one of the great questions in biology just behind the two epic ones, which are the origin of life and the nature of consciousness. The, the next one down is called the evolution of multicellularity, trying to understand how it was and why it was that the first organisms that appeared out of the primordial soup, which were clearly single cell organisms and we would call them bacteria, evolved eventually to become larger, for sure, but also have more cells and to divide up the functions of life into different cell types. So this is a graph that shows data for many different types of organisms. Notice it's a log-log scale in which we have the number of distinct cell types as determined by some consistent counting mechanism of the authors, Bell and Moores, and later John Bonner at Princeton, as a function of the total number of cells in the body. Okay, so a bacterium is at 1, 1, lower left-hand corner, and a highly developed human, such as a CDT director, um, has about 210, well, probably 211, uh, distinct cell types, and a human body is about 10 to the 14th cells. So just off the top of that graph. Now, if you're a statistical physicist, like I once was, you might be tempted to find a straight line there. Don't. <laughs> First of all, it wouldn't be very well defined. But second of all, what does one number tell us about all of this biology? So if we want to try to understand this general trend, which, by the way, you see in human endeavors, right? When, when Bill Gates and collaborators were just two people in a garage inventing windows, or stealing it, uh, they, um, <laughs> You know, they were probably basically doing the same thing, but by the time you have an organism as large as Microsoft, you have to divide up the labor in order to make the software so bad. Um, <laughs> and, and so you see this in universities, you see it everywhere. But if we really want to make progress in understanding this, I suggest, and others have suggested, that we should be reductionist. We should look in the lower left-hand corner of this graph and try to understand things like, as we increase the number of cells in an organism from one to hundreds, we suddenly see a jump in the case of green algae, to two cell types. Why is that? Can we understand the size at which that occurred and the mechanisms that drove it to that? Now, if you think about life on the small scale, as James Lighthill did, microorganisms that are microns in size, swimming in a fluid which, at that scale, is very viscous, um, then basically life is a, it's a problem of chemical engineering because it's a problem of diffusion and buoyancy and mixing and uptake of nutrients and excretion of waste products. And so it's not surprising that people like us would try to understand these kinds of questions. Now, one of the heroes of today's talk is Antony von Leeuwenhoek, whose name you probably know. He was not the inventor of the microscope, but he was the perfecter of the microscope. And he wrote many letters to the Royal Society of things that he discovered with these amazing little microscopes that are the size of a couple of postage stamps with a single millimetric lens that allowed him to see things with great precision compared to his competitors. And one of the things that he discovered is what I'll talk about today. So I'm going to tell you a story involving two different green algae that you can find in the River Cam near Cambridge or probably in the Thames. Um, one of them is called Chlamydomonas reinhardi. It's about 10 microns across. It has these two flagella, which are composed of polymerized proteins called microtubules, and they are cross-linked by molecular motors, proteins that consume energy and slide the filaments past each other and thereby produce a waving pattern. And it is an ancestor, or in some sense a cousin, of a multicellular organism called Volvox, which is half a millimeter across and has thousands of cells on its surface, each of them with these two flagella and able to swim uh, in, in a fluid medium. 
Now, these two organisms already show you something about what I was telling you of multicellularity. This is a single cell that does all the functions of life, meaning photosynthesis, motility, listening to the BBC, et cetera. This organism has two cell types. It has specialized uh, uh, germ cells on the inside, the smaller spheres that you see that are the reproductive uh, cells that eventually grow up to become the next generation. And it has sterile uh, galley slaves on the outside whose only job it is to swim. And actually, these are just two extremes of a kind of lineage of green algae that were tailor-made for mathematicians. Okay, so here's a family portrait of some of these. Clamidomonas here, 10 microns across. There are species with two to the n cells that are produced by successive uh, cell divisions. Gonium with eight or 16, Euderina 64, all the way up to 50,000 cells in an organism that can be several millimeters across. So if we want to understand things like fluid mechanics uh, on different scales, we have this set of organisms built out of the same building blocks, but spanning a range from 10 microns to a few millimeters. So it's a perfectly made system to study scaling laws in biology. But as you see here, there's also an interesting point that all of the species to the left of this line have all the cells doing every function of life. And to the right of that line, there's a sudden appearance of two cell types, as I indicated in the data graph, where we have the reproductive cells on the inside and the galley slaves on the outside. And a natural question, which is still under debate, is why did nature put that dividing line there? What's special about that size or that number of cells that makes it evolutionarily advantageous to have two cell types? And I'm just going to tell you in the beginning a little story about how we could use some simple physical reasoning to start to see the role of these flagella in that question. So here's a modern view of Volvox uh, taken with a tracking microscope that we built in my lab. So basically it's swimming up through a, a laser sheet coming from above. It's surrounded by microspheres. And we have a camera sitting on a motorized stage with feedback control, so it's just moving up. Uh, so we can actually sit in the frame of reference of the organism and study its fluid mechanics, answering questions like, how do I take a thousand flagella on the surface and get some coherent flow out of it? Now, from the biological perspective, there are many reasons to study these organisms. As I said, they're easily obtainable in nature. Uh, we can study them from many different perspectives, ecological, uh, biochemical, genetic, etc. cetera. Uh, and we know something about their history because they've been re recently sequenced so we can start to understand the genetic origins of multicellularity. But the other thing to say is they're spherical. And any time you want to do theory in this world of biophysics on the scale of the cell, it certainly helps to have something with that symmetry. So forgive me if I mention that, but it's really true. <laughs> okay, so there are many things you can do with these organisms. They're sort of wonders of the world that have only recently been realized in biological physics as these versatile creatures. And you can read about it in an article I wrote two years ago uh, for annual reviews. So you could use it to study multicellularity. You can use it to study problems like the hydrodynamic interaction between swimming organisms near a surface, where they can form things we call hydrodynamic bound states. They're kind of like atomic bound states in the sense that there's a, a long-range attractive interaction mediated by the wall that actually drives these things together. You can use it to study the flow fields and this general question of how do I connect the action of individual flagella to the large-scale flows. As I'll describe today, you can use it to study synchronization. You can hold them on a micropipette gently and actually interrogate a single cell under the microscope and study its flagellar dynamics. You can study the question of how an organism with a thousand cells on its surface and no central nervous system nevertheless manages to steer coherently toward the light. Because these organisms are photosynthetic and they need the light, so it's a control theory problem. And there are also some physics -y issues about tracer statistics. But let me start by just pointing out one important thing here to this audience, which is we can all appreciate that the Reynolds number in these systems is small. So if you look at the characteristic swimming speeds, which are measured in microns or tens or hundreds of microns per second, the characteristic length scales in the problem, which are at most uh, millimeters, and the kinematic viscosity of water, the Reynolds numbers are typically 10 to the minus 4. In the most extreme case, they're 10 to the minus 2 or so. But there's more to life than just transport of momentum. These organisms are uptaking and giving off carbon dioxide and oxygen as they do photosynthesis. So if we have a molecular species with a molecular diffusivity D in the solution, we'd also like to know what is the relative importance of advection to diffusion, not just dissipation. So the Peclet number, as you probably all know, is a characteristic, a ratio of characteristic timescales for diffusion and advection. 
the characteristic advective time scale on a, for an organism of size L would be just L over U, and the diffusive time scale would be L squared over D. So the ratio just looks exactly like the Reynolds number, except the molecular diffusivity takes the role of the kinematic viscosity. But D for a small molecule is three orders of magnitude smaller than the kinematic viscosity of water. So the Peclet number is automatically much closer to one. And in fact, what you discover by making measurements is that the Peclet number for this fellow swimming around in the world is below one, maybe 0.1 or 0.2. But the Peclet number for this guy is something like 200. So this transition from a single cell organism to a multicellular one is also accompanied by a transition from a world dominated by diffusion to a world dominated by advection. And the advection comes from these flagella. So now let's do a little thought calculation here. Imagine I try to calculate the current of nutrients. Think of it as oxygen or phosphate ions or whatever you wish, coming to an organism that is built in the form of a sphere. Now, if you're built like Volvox with all your tissue on the surface of the sphere, the metabolic needs that you will have will scale with the surface area, and hence like R squared. But as you know, at low Reynolds number, in a passive environment with no fluid flow, the diffusion-limited flux that you can get to the surface of a sphere only scales like radius, not like R squared. And that's because the, long, the characteristic uh, concentration field falls off only like 1 over R. So clearly, the needs will grow faster than the input by diffusion. And there will come a point when, as you look at ever larger organisms, they will not be able to get enough nutrients purely by diffusion. And if you try to put in numbers, you discover that this crossing point is somewhere vaguely in the region of transition between the organisms that have all the cells the same and those that have two cell types. So this raises an interesting question. What could fluid flow driven by these flagella actually do for this organism? Well, here's a simple calculation, which is a kind of when we first did this, it was uh, essentially not knowing that Tim Pedley was doing essentially the same calculation using a model from James Lighthill. But the basic idea is to say, just forget about all the complicated dynamics of flagella on the surface. Imagine that the net effect of that is just to produce a shear force at the surface. So you imagine a sphere covered with a vector field of shear forces from the North Pole to the South Pole. And the force per unit area being F, you can do a simple calculation to find the uh, analytic flow field around this organism. And what you discover is that the characteristic swimming speed scales with the shear force uh, density and the radius inversely with the viscosity. And basically, there's R squared worth of force on the surface and R's worth of dissipation of drag on a sphere. And so that's how you get a velocity that scales with R. And here are some measurements using particle image velocimetry of the flow field around a Volvox colony. And you see it fits this theory quite nicely. So now we can ask the question, which is an interesting problem in chemical engineering. What is the rate of transport to an organism that's creating its own swimming field? So we're looking at a steady state problem of advection and diffusion. And it turns out this is a well-known problem in the context of heat transport. I think it was first studied by Levesque. You have a hot, oops, a hot sphere in a wind, and you want to know the rate of heat loss. So the result is that there's a boundary layer that forms at high velocities. And the current looks like the current from diffusion, namely proportional to R, but pushed up with a fractional power of the Peclet number that reflects the formation of this boundary layer. So if the Peclet number is really large, you'll get a lot more heat transport. But this was from a solid sphere with a no-slip boundary condition. And just at the same time that we were doing our calculation, Tim Pedley and Goto had looked at what is called the Lighthill Squirmer, which is a model with a specified tangential velocity field. So we were talking about a specified force. That's a specified tangential velocity field. But the result is the same, that the current in this problem actually looks very much the same, except with a different power of the Peclet number, Peclet to the 1 half. And this you can understand by just doing a little balance of the dominant advective and diffusive pieces normal to the surface, and you'll discover that the characteristic size of a boundary layer scales like Peclet to the minus 1 half. OK, so what does this mean? Well, if the characteristic swimming speed scales with the radius and the Peclet looks like radius times swimming speed, then the Peclet number actually goes like r squared. And if you collect all the unknowns in the problem, you discover there's a new length in the problem, this advective scale, which is about 10 microns. And it's actually much smaller than this bottleneck size that I showed you. So now you can ask the question, if I'm in this high Peclet number regime, what's my uptake? And the answer is you, you simply integrate over the surface. You look at the gradient of the concentration. It's basically the far field concentration divided by RA. And you discover that it goes like R squared, because it goes like the square root of the Peclet number. In other words, the fluid flow erases the bottleneck. So if I look on a log-log scale of the currents I was speaking of before, the metabolic needs go like R squared. 
the diffusive possibility goes like R, and the advective piece peels off, and there's no more bottleneck. So this is a possible explanation as to why it's evolutionarily advantageous to have two cell types, because you want to keep everybody swimming in order to keep this nutrient uptake sufficiently high. OK, so with that little brief whirlwind introduction to how you might start thinking about fluid mechanics and flagella, now I want to focus on this problem of synchronization. Now, we've come a little bit from the time of Van Leeuwenhoek uh, in the form of microscopes. So now we have a little bit better microscopes um, with all sorts of important attachments, like high-speed cameras, uh, LEDs that we can couple through fiber optic light guides to shine light on individual cells to study their phototactic response, uh, all sorts of hydraulics uh, to hold with gentle suction these organisms and actually see what they're doing. And if you look closely, uh, you'll see that this, this really is essentially borrowing from the world of electrophysiology or in vitro fertilization. So this is the same kind of technology to hold an egg and inject a sperm. Okay, so the first movie I want to show you is old, a little bit grainy, as old movies should be, but it's uh, sentimentally important because it shows you what you see if you look at the edge of a volvox colony. Remember, it's about half a millimeter across, and each of these cells on the surface is about 10 microns across. We've done some image processing, and you see the galloping of these two flagella that are directly in focus and others a little bit out of focus on either side. And you see some spheres being advected along. Now, as you watch these two, you will be tempted to think that sometimes they appear synchronized in the sense that they beat together, but then they seem to fall out of sync, and then they come back. So is this just two oscillators of slightly different frequency, like piano notes that are adjacent to one another that beat against each other, or is there some form of synchrony? Many other videos I'll show you will convince you there's definite synchrony. But we're confronted with the problem of how do you analyze a time series like this and decide, A, what the nature of synchrony is, and B, what the mechanism is. That's the challenge. OK, now every time we talk about synchrony in biology, or physics for that matter, it's important to remind everyone of Huygens. So how many know about the Huygens clock problem? Hmm. Well, now you will. <laughs> So, right around the time that von Leeuwenhoek was working, Christian Huygens published an incredibly important paper about the synchronization of pendulum clocks. Synchronization of clocks was important then because of issues of long-term navigation. You know, if you, if you want to look at the stars and know where you are, you have to know what time it is. And if your ship left port a month ago, its clock is not going to probably be following the time properly, so can you synchronize things? Can you somehow solve that problem? So he observed that when two pendulum clocks were on some sort of wall or wooden support <clears throat> that they would, after a fashion, no matter how they were started, eventually synchronize, mostly in antiphase like this. And he deduced that it was vibrations in the wall to which they were attached that led to the synchrony. And in some sense, the question I'm trying to ask, answer today is, what's the equivalent of the wall in biology? And uh, here's a little video that I stole from YouTube to show you how this works. And you can do this at home. Okay, so we have, this has been sped up by a factor of two, so it doesn't take quite so long to see. Five metronomes, all identical frequencies, arbitrary initial phases, placed on a piece of wood that is about to be put on top of these two soda cans. And that allows lateral motion. And you can hear that they're not in sync. But already, within a few beats, they start to synchronize. And you can see a little bit of wiggle right here. Now, the one in the center is slow to get the message. Whoops, very slow to get the message. Did I press stop? No. There we go. Sorry. Too many buttons. And finally, synchrony. Right. So all it takes is some kind of elastic coupling, and you can synchronize linear oscillators. So the natural question then is, if we see synchrony, as I will show you, then what is the underlying mechanism? Now, coming from Cambridge, I must remind you of a very important paper by our patron saint, um, G.I. Taylor, uh, in 1951, in which he was trying to address experimental observations made by Lord Rothschild about swimming sperm cells that were found to swim in sync uh, very quickly, uh, nested so closely together you could barely tell them apart. So these are free-swimming cells. And he said, well, let's just abstract this into the simplest model we can. Imagine a two-dimensional world, so translation invariance this way, where I have basically a carpet with a rock in it. 
that's a translating sinusoidal deformation of this sheet and one above it, separated by some distance. And I have a zero Reynolds number fluid all around it. And I want to solve for the fluid mechanics as a function of the relative phase of these two sine waves, which I just treat as a parameter of the problem. So you can solve this order by order in an expansion in the amplitude of the sine wave divided by the wavelength. And one of the things he focused on was the rate of energy dissipation when the sheets are out of phase relative to in phase, because he had the idea that, quite plausibly, that somehow the in phase state is more streamlined. Now, if you think about it, and remember your fluid mechanics, the rate of energy dissipation is the integral of the square of the gradients of velocity. So a situation where they're out of phase like this and nearly banging together is going to produce a lot more gradients and a lot more dissipation than when they're in phase and the spacing is nearly constant. So that calculation shows that as a function of the separation between the sheets, the ratio starts at 1 because they don't talk to each other. And as you bring it down to the kinds of spacing seen in experiment, the dissipation can drop by a factor of 3. So the plausible interpretation is that if nature minimizes dissipation, then we have explained synchrony. Well, Taylor has explained synchrony. But I have to remind you that minimizing dissipation is not, in general, a principle of nature. It's not like minimizing the action in mechanics. It might be true, but it's not the general principle from which you derive dynamics. I should say, however, that if you take this model, which doesn't really have dynamics in it, and you add elasticity to the filaments, or to the sheets, so that they can elastically rearrange, and you put dynamics in, as my colleague Eric Loga did, then you can actually get a dynamical evolution towards synchrony. So that's pretty interesting. But this is a long way from flagella. And we want to have something a little bit clearer. OK, so now let me tell you the historical state of affairs in the mid, late, mid to late 1980s, where the pioneering work of two biologists, Ruffer and Nulch, laid the groundwork for everything that I will tell you about today. So they were interested in Chlamydomonas synchronization. And they held Chlamydomonas on micropipettes. So remember, it's about 10 microns across. And they used then available high-speed imaging technology, which for most people in the room looking around, it will be completely foreign. It involves plastic film, right? No digital anything. And therefore, they were restricted in the time course they could look at simply by the manpower necessary to process the images. So they would take each image, put it on a light table, trace by hand the waveform, and determine from that the period of motion of the left flagellum and the right flagellum of the two. And what they found is that if you plot the frequency of those two flagella as a function of time over about half a second, that 85% of the time when they grabbed a cell from solution and looked at it, the two flagella did what we call the breaststroke, which is the very characteristic swimming motion of these, two, these, these cells. And they did it with the same frequency. There might be a little bit of jitter from beat to beat, but they were in sync. About 10% of the time, during this window of observation, one of the flagella would beat faster for a few beats, so the frequency would go up, and then it would come back and rejoin the other one. And then about 5% of the time, the two flagella appeared disconnected from each other, beating at frequencies that were 20 or 30% different from each other. Okay, so the natural interpretation would be this. As I look around the room, some of you are coordinated well and some not so well. And surely that's the case for microorganisms. So these are different subpopulations of cells. Okay? So it's a natural biological interpretation. Now, what I'm going to tell you is that everything they said up to this point is absolutely correct. And this is dead wrong. But you should not hold it against them because they simply didn't have the technology to see what was going on. But they discovered the three modes, and that's what I want to tell you about. Okay. So now comes a question in applied mathematics. I'm going to take movies of beating flagella, and Chlamydomonas flagella beat at 55 cycles per second, let's say. So I'm going to, these are going to be high-speed movies at high magnification. I'm going to show you one in a moment. And the question is, what am I supposed to measure? How am I supposed to quantify these beating dynamics? Now, I can tell you, because I've, many people have tried to do this, is that mathematically, if you wanted to build a model for the beating flagella, these would be fourth order partial differential equations, that is, first order in time derivatives, fourth order in space derivatives because there's elasticity somewhere, highly nonlinear because of the geometry, and coupled to internal biochemical details. So it's not immediately obvious that you can take a waveform and say, oh, yes, I can just extract the parameters of this complicated model from it. Our point of view is these are oscillators. Oscillators go round and round. Therefore, we can assign a phase angle to them. I'm not going to fit a model. I'm going to extract an angle that tells me where I am in each cycle. 
So I can think of the amplitude or the strokes of the two flagella as some amplitude, which I'm not going to focus on too much, and cosine of some time-dependent angle. And if the two flagella had different frequencies, say, omega-1 and omega-2, then those angles would just evolve linearly in time, and I'd get cosine omega-t and cosine omega-2-t. Obviously, there's more to life than that. But I'm going to define a quantity called delta, which is the difference of these two angles, conveniently divided by 2 pi, as a measure of how in phase they are. And of course, if it were really trivial that they didn't talk to each other and had different frequencies, that would be just a straight line in time. Okay, so here's a movie, also sentimental and grainy, uh, in which you can see from image processing what's left over of the micropipette and the cell body, and, but we've highlighted the um, flagella. So here you see them beating at 55 cycles per second. And as you watch it, you can see there's some noise, but they're very nicely in sync. But just keep watching. Right there. Clearly, they went out of sync. But then they got back in sync. That's what Rufer and Nilch saw 10% of the time, a transient asynchrony. But we're not restricted in our high-speed imaging to half a second. We have cameras now with so much memory, we can take 30 minutes of movies at 3,000 frames a second and store it all there. Right? So we can really try to analyze this uh, as interesting long time series. Oops. OK. So the second thing to say is that, yes, there are oscillators that go round and round. And one of the ways you can study oscillators is by a Poincaré section. So we're essentially going to erect little interrogation windows on either side of the cell body and watch the pixel intensity go up and down as the flagella goes through that interrogation window. And that'll tell us each time we've traversed one whole cycle. So that's a Poincaré section of the dynamics. And from that, we can get the phase difference and plot that as a function of time here, at the moment, only over four seconds. And it's shown in blue with red a running average. So it's noisy. And that noise is not the statistical fluctuations of an elastic filament in a heat bath. You can do that calculation. It's a good exercise for CDT students. <laughs> uh, and um, it's orders of magnitude below the noise that we see here. So this is the discovery, actually, that eukaryotic flagellar beating is noisy. Not surprising. Uh, but what you see is that over the course of time, there's a noisy transition from one value to another that differed precisely by one. So that means that there was a gain or loss of one complete cycle of one flagellum relative to the other. And in nonlinear dynamics, that's called a phase slip. So that's what we'll call these, phase slips. And if you look at the periodic signals, you see they're nicely in the windows. You see they're nicely in sync. Then there's some confusion. And then they're back in sync. But that's just a snippet of the trace of one particular cell. Now let's look at that same data, but over, say, a minute. And this is what you see. Single cell delta, angle difference divided by 2 pi, is all over the place. If you look inside the dynamics, you see there's periods of noisy synchrony where you hover around one value. There are slips of either sign, so the left flagellum or the right flagellum can gain or lose a cycle. And then you have periods which roughly look like drifts, where the, there's a well-defined slope to the time dependence of that. But it's a single cell. So if you average this data over many, many, many cells, you discover that the fraction of time spent in these three epochs is 85, 10, 5, exactly like Rufer and Nilch found. And that means something incredibly deep in biology. Because it's just like in statistical physics, right? If I wanted to know the average, I don't know, heart rate of all of you, I could measure him for a long period of time. Or I could take a snapshot of all of you and get your instantaneous rates and average. And I get the same if it's ergodic. So this system is ergodic. And it doesn't have to be that way, but it is. So that's really interesting. But there's more to this. I've got a time series. I've got some theories out there. Can I extract something interesting from it in terms of the question I was trying to answer, which is, what is the mechanism of synchrony? So before I tell you how we do this, I want to make a digression. So I made a joke about spherical cows. You probably all know the story of the farmer who consulted the physicist, and the physicist who said, well, you know, consider a spherical cow to begin with. But actually, it turns out in this world, amazingly, surprisingly, describing the fluid dynamics created by a beating flagellum in terms of a little sphere going around in an orbit is actually a reasonable approximation, although on the face of it, it sounds silly. But that's what a large number of theoreticians have used to try to understand synchrony, 
And here's an ex post facto justification experimentally that this is the case. So this is the time average flow field around a swimming Chlamydomonas, where, whose body would be here, obtained in a heroic experiment by my then PhD student, Knut Drescher, in which the cells would swim through a sea of microspheres, and only those tracks that were in focus in the focal plane for some sufficiently long time were considered, and we did particle image velocimetry in the frame of motion as they twisted and turned around, and then rebroadcast all that back into one frame, and this is the time average motion. So you see the swirls created by the flagella doing this. You see fluid getting pushed forward by the cell body and coming in from behind. This is the classic flow field uh, that you would expect for these organisms. And I went over to, and talked to Tim at some point, and I said, you know, I remember a paper of yours where you, you said you could think of this in terms of three stokeslets. And uh, we tried three stokeslets. So here's a point force acting on a fluid from the cell body. And here's one point force and another, each roughly at the elbows of the flagella, pushing back so that the total sum of the forces is zero, as it must be for a freely swimming organism. And it gets the flow field precisely. It gets the stagnation point in front, the swirls, the incoming outcoming behavior. So it's actually not bad to think about the flow field as just essentially like the center of mass of the flagellum going around in an orbit. And that's good, because otherwise a lot of people would be embarrassed by having published theories about this. And some of the best theories uh, are due to Niedermeyer, Eckhart, and Lenz, and also the group of Jean-Francois Joanny in Paris and Frank Ulicker in Dresden. And they've said, look, let's try to understand synchrony in the following way. I have two flagella modeled as spheres that go around in orbits where the circular motion is due to the internal forces that represent the molecular motors that create the beat. And there might be a surface nearby with a no-slip condition, but as that uh, sphere moves around, of course, it pushes fluid as a stokeslet, which is felt by the other sphere. Now, each of these spheres is held to the center of its orbit, of its unperturbed orbit, by a spring with a reference equilibrium length R0, but can stretch a little bit, and that represents the elasticity of the flagellum, what we'll call waveform compliance. So you let these two guys go, and you see what happens. And the basic idea is, well, you look in both the radial and azimuthal directions at a balance of forces. So you have the drag coefficient of the sphere times the azimuthal velocity, its radius times its angular velocity, minus the component of the fluid velocity from the other one, equals that internal force that's pushing things around. In the radial direction, you have a spring, which is trying to keep the radius at R0. And again, drag force times velocity minus the component from the other piece. Okay? But you take advantage of a separation of time scales, which is true in this case, and it's true in many cases in physics, which is that the radial direction motion is fast compared to the azimuthal motion, and therefore you slave the fast variable to the slow variable. And so when the dust settles, you end up with a single uh, angular dynamics. And when a little more dust settles, you end up with an equation of motion for our friend delta, the angular difference between the two uh, angles, the difference between the two angles of the flagella. So it really, that model gives you the first two terms of this equation. Delta nu is the intrinsic frequency difference of the two oscillators that would be there naturally. And then you end up with a piece sinusoidal in capital delta. Now remember, this is a phase angle, so it must be periodic, and sine's the lowest one that comes out. And the coupling in front, epsilon, depends on all the physics I told you, the viscosity of the fluid, the size of the spheres, the distance between them, the frequency, et cetera. Now, before I mention the possibility that this, this should be a stochastic equation, which is pretty obvious from the data I showed you, let's just understand the mechanism of this, because it's so simple and beautiful, it's worth remembering. Imagine I have two flagella beating like this, and therefore the two spheres are going in the same direction. And it just so happens that this one lags behind this one. Well, it will push fluid in the direction of the arrow, which will push this one away from its equilibrium position to a larger radius. But by the constraints of this problem, there's a fixed internal force. So if I go to a larger radius, I must then have a smaller angular velocity, so the Stokes drag is the same. And therefore, this one slows down, and this guy, therefore, catches up. And if this one happens to lead, the fluid gets pushed this way, which pushes this one to a smaller radius, and hence a higher angular velocity, and again, they meet. So it's a stable mechanism of synchrony. And it involves two things, hydrodynamic coupling and waveform compliance. But I told you our system is noisy, and the simplest thing you could do is to make this a Langevin equation. By the way, the deterministic equation is called the Adler equation. It was first developed by Adler in the context of synchronized electrical oscillators. He's also the Adler who gave us the remote control for the television, so an important man. Um, 
so the simplest thing you could do is to assume that whatever noise is in the cell has zero mean and is delta function correlated, like it is in statistical physics, with some effective temperature that describes the variance. And so now the question for the CDT student is, if I have a time series like this, could you extract from the time series the three unknown parameters in the problem? The intrinsic frequency difference between the two oscillators, the strength of the coupling, and this effective temperature. Now, I always tell my students there are three fundamental tricks that you need to know in mathematical physics. Adding zero, multiplying by one, both of those are mostly in quantum mechanics, right? and mapping it onto a previously solved problem. So I choose the third. Because this is just a disguised version of the stochastic dynamics of a little Brownian particle on a tilted washboard potential. Because I can think of the two deterministic terms in this equation as the force, the negative derivative of some potential, acting on a sphere whose position is delta. And so a constant term delta nu produces a tilt, a linear term in capital delta, and a sine becomes a cosine. So I have a standard problem of motion on a tilted washboard potential. And I therefore interpret periods of synchrony as my fictitious particle lying at one or the other of these minima, if they exist. And noisy synchrony means that I'm just getting Brownian motion in the bottom of that well. If I see a slip, that corresponds to a thermally assisted hop to the right or the left. And I know from statistical physics the probability ratio of hopping to the left or the right, that's just related to the barrier height divided by the effective temperature. And a little calculation of Brownian motion in a parabolic potential, when it exists, will tell you that the autocorrelation function of the noise there has a prefactor and a time scale controlled by the two other parameters in the problem, the effective temperature and the frequency difference that we don't know. Sorry, the amplitude, uh, epsilon, that we don't know. So if you have enough data, you can extract them from these measurements. So several terabytes of data later, this is what you get. So here's a probability distribution of the measured values of the coupling strength, epsilon, made dimensionless by the mean frequency. And it's ridiculous, but it clusters exactly around what you would estimate from the model of Niedermeyer, Eckhart, and Lenz, where you interpret the spring constant of the flagellum based on the stiffness of the material, which we know, and a characteristic time scale related to the size, the equivalent size of the sphere, the cube of the length of the flagellum, because that's the stiffness, the inverse stiffness of an elastic beam, and the bending modulus. Now, so this is not a proof that hydrodynamics is the origin of this, but it's a consistency check that the scale of the coupling is consistent with the idea of fluid mechanics between these things. The other thing to say is that if you make a scatter plot of the effective temperature deduced from the experiments and the frequency difference between the two flagella, it clusters on this log scale into two domains with a big gap in between. Now note, this is the intrinsic frequency difference, not the measured frequency difference. When they're synchronized, it's, the measured one is zero, obviously. That's the definition of synchrony. But underlying that, there's a tilt to this potential. And by this stochastic process, you can extract that. And what you see is that the periods of noisy synchrony correspond to frequency shifts that are about 1% at the most. But when you're in the noisy um, uh, drifting state, the frequency difference is like what you see, 20% or 30%, and not much in between. So the interpretation is that Chlamydomonas sort of has two gears. It has the ability to adjust the tilt of this washboard potential, the frequency difference between the two flagella. So it can be small enough that there are minima and hydrodynamics couples them, and it can be large enough that there no longer are minima, and it just the, the particle just runs downhill. And in fact, there's a fair amount of evidence that this kind of tuning is a consequence of calcium. Okay, so now imagine the following. You are Chlamydomonas, and you are moving along, and every once in a while, your right flagellum starts beating faster than your left flagellum, or your right foot starts walking faster than your left foot, what will happen? You'll fall over. If you're me, you'll fall over, but you'll turn. <laughs> right? And then you'll go in a straight line for a while, and then this one will go faster, and then you'll turn, and then you'll go again. So these periods of drifts ought to correspond to turns. So we said, well, that's a kind of random walk, right? If I'm stochastically turning, I should execute a random walk. If I have a collection of these things, I should see diffusion. So we said, let's look in the literature and find the diffusion constant of Chlamydomonas. And it wasn't there. So we invented this little experiment. This is really the work of Marco Pauline, a postdoc in my group at the time. 
a little experiment. You take a cuvette full of Chlamydomonas, you centrifuge it gently so they go to the bottom. You put it in front of a, a dark light, a, a backlighting system so that you can then watch as they swim how they refill the cuvette. And if you look at the leading edge of this concentration profile or intensity profile, at the flux of cells across a given line as a function of the gradient of cells at that point, if you get a straight line, it's called Fick's law. And the slope gives you the diffusion constant. And that's what you get. And the diffusion constant in round numbers is 10 to the minus 3 centimeters squared per second, which is meaningless, right, to, unless you're really deeply into Chlamydomonas. But, but think about it for a moment. If I have a random walk, and the only thing that characterizes it is the speed with which I move straight and the time between turns, then dimensionally, a diffusion constant must be u squared tau. We know how fast Chlamydomonas swims on average, 100 microns per second. Therefore, from that number, we deduce there's a time scale of around 10 seconds. So we predict that every 10 seconds or so, Chlamydomonas turns. So just at this time, we thought, oh, let's publish. But then just at this time, we had finished making this shown schematically here. This is a, a contraption to actually measure the swimming of cells in three dimensions with high spatiotemporal resolution, free from the problems that come from having centimeter scale blocks of fluid illuminated with red light, namely thermal convection. So we use red light because those, that's the color they don't care about, and therefore we wouldn't bias uh, the swimming. The problem is, if you have a little chamber with even millikelvin difference across faces, that's enough to create thermal convective rolls that will spoil everything. So you have to develop a, a, a complicated heat bath and stirring mechanism. And when all is said and done, you can track these cells in three dimensions. And this is a typical trace in a subvolume of this inner chamber. So you see this wiggling trajectory, because they basically swim in helices. And we've color-coded the trajectory by the angular velocity of the tangent vector to the curve, so the turning rate. And you see this sharp turn, especially projected down here. And here's that angular velocity as a function of time. So there's a sharp turn. If you have a time series of capital omega, you can see, you know, segment the whole thing and look at the statistics of the turns. And this is what you find. They peak up at about a radian per second. But the most important thing is I can now compare two things. When I hold one of these cells on a micropipette, it occasionally goes into this drift state. And it lasts in that state some period of time, a distributed period of time, drift shown in red, peaking up at about two seconds. And when I look at the three-dimensional freely swimming cells, I can look at the duration of their turns. And it peaks up with the exact same statistics. So the act of holding the cells didn't perturb them. And indeed, every time they drift, in the sense of synchrony, they turn. And if you look at the probability distribution of the time between turning events, it's exponential with an 11-second time scale. So that shows it. Chlamydomonas stochastically switches from periods of synchrony to asynchrony and back. Now, we don't know why it does that. And we even don't know how it does that. But it's a very close match to what bacteria do, such as the E. coli that are waiting for dinner in your gut. Um, they transiently bundle and unbundle their flagella to execute random walks. So this is run in turn in bacteria is called run and tumble. OK, but we're still not quite sure what the mechanism is for synchrony when there is synchrony. And of course, it seems like we're kind of stuck with the flagella that nature gave us of a certain length, in this case, about 12 microns. But it turns out that these organisms have a fantastic ability to lose their flagella and regrow them. So if they're subjected to hydrodynamic shear or mechanical shock or something like this, they will shed their flagella. And you can do this, actually, uh, by bringing another micropipette here and just gently aspirating. But they regrow it in a period of about two hours. So this is clearly some defense mechanism. They basically say, OK, take the flagella if you want. I've got others I can produce. So we thought, you know, it, if it takes two hours to regrow that, that's, that's an infinite time on the scale of an experiment to study synchrony. So we can measure synchrony as a function of the length of the flagella. And remember that the stiffness of an elastic beam is 1 over the length cubed, the, the spring constant at the end there. And therefore, the coupling should go like length cubed. And therefore, this should be a big effect. So here's what you see. This is uh, the regrowth of the flagella, their observed length as a function of time after deflagellation. And you see it takes about 90 minutes to get back up to where you were. And this is a log-log plot of a, our friend delta as a function of time as a function of time after deflagellation. So here at 20 minutes is when you can just barely see them and see what's going on. And you see that the data shows no sign of a plateau. 
In other words, no synchrony. But as you get to 30 minutes, a little bit of a hint, 40 minutes, a few plateaus, 50, 60, 70, then huge plateaus as you get longer and longer flagella. And the theory says that if you plot the cube root of the coupling constant deduced as I showed you before, divided by the frequency to the two-thirds as a function of L, you should get a straight line. And you do. So that seems to say that this elasto-hydrodynamic mechanism works. And therefore, Niedermeyer, Eckhart, and Lenz should get, and do get, lots of credit for inventing this model and explaining this simple mechanism for synchrony. synchrony. Almost. Because in the world of biology, it's always important to look at mutants, organisms that are deficient in one way or another genetically and phenotypically in their behavior. And that's a way of understanding the wild type behavior. So here's a stylized beating dynamics of a real chlamydomonas cell in which we've color coded the uh, flagella based on the phase they are in, in, uh, in the period. And this is the expected breaststroke. Now, my postdoc, uh, Kyriakos Leptos, who is a biologist by training, said that of all the mutants of chlamydomonas that we might study, one in particular was worth studying. It's called PTX1 or 2 or 3 or 4, meaning phototaxis, the steering toward light. They're deficient in the ability to steer toward light. And this mutation is very close in its phenomenology to ciliopathies in humans, where there are problems in mucus clearing. So we looked at this organism. I have to start it over here. And if the left is the breaststroke, this is the freestyle. It's antiphase synchrony. So there's a problem here, because that effective potential that I described to you before had minima every 2 pi or so. And if I have to shift that by pi, I've got to change the sign of something. Now, I'm not going to change the sign of the viscosity of the fluid. I'm not gonna, there are many things I can't do here. So this is a real problem for theory to understand how you get this antiphase synchrony hydrodynamically. Now, in, with more modern technology, we can study this at extremely high temporal resolution. So here, over many, many seconds at about uh, two or 3,000 frames a second, we can see that there's stochastic hopping from in phase to antiphase and back, actually. So this organism can do the breaststroke or the freestyle and stochastically switches back and forth. And every time it does that, the beat frequency jumps quite a lot. So this is a, almost like a different mode of motion. Now, you might say, is this really antiphase? Well, you can just identify two points on the flagella and make a polar plot of the angle of one versus the angle of the other. In the in-phase state, in this phase portrait, it closely hugs the diagonal. This is a single cell on a single time series where the light green shows you the variance. And for a single cell in the antiphase state, it's pretty close to the other diagonal. And if you average over a bunch of cells, it's absolutely clear that this is real antiphase, so it's pi. Now, there are many, many issues, many things to say about this. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to come back to it in just the last couple of minutes. But we're now in an interesting situation. We've got a problem in the sense that the mutant does something weird. Uh, we have still this question of, if I had only hydrodynamics, is that enough to synchronize things, a la Taylor? Because after all, we're looking at two flagella inside a single cell. So there could clearly be stuff going on inside the cell that plays a role in synchrony. So if we want to disentangle this, we do the ultimate experiment, as I call it. That is, you have an organism here with one flagellum, another organism physically distinct on a separate pipette with one flagellum, and you let them talk to each other. And then there's no way there's something going on biochemically inside because they're not connected. So this is a, a PIV map of the flow field around these two cells, and the experiment is basically like this. You have two micropipettes whose position and orientation can be altered at will, so you can you can grab a cell, you can flip it over, you can rotate it, you can put them in any configuration you want at any spacing you want and study all the same things. So here's delta uh, in, this, in, in a configuration where they're beating in the same direction. Here's delta as a function of time. Uh, when they are close together, as you see in red, uh, they are highly synchronized. And as you move them further apart, the synchrony goes away. Now, remember the mechanism I told you of Niedermeyer, Eckhart, and Lenz. I said, imagine two flagella going in the same direction. And that's what I just showed you here. Okay, so when they go in the same direction, they tend to synchronize in phase. But Chlamydomonas swims like this. Right? So if you do the calculation of two microspheres going around 
this way, in opposite directions, and you ask, what does hydrodynamics do? Actually, it picks antiphase. So this is disturbing, because the night before our paper in 2009 came out in science, I suddenly said, whoa, is this sign right? <laughs> so all we said, fortunately, in the paper was the magnitude of the coupling was consistent with hydrodynamics. But the sign was all wrong. So the antiphase state in the mutant is the one expected, and the wild type is the one that doesn't make any sense. All right? So that was a good lesson. <laughs> so here it is, proof experimentally that if the cells are only connected together by hydrodynamics, when they're close together, they are synchronized. When they fall, move further apart, they fall out of synchrony. And the measured coupling constant as a function of distance falls off like one over the distance, which is exactly what you'd expect from a Stokes loop. So that's consistent. And if you now reverse the orientation of the two cells, so that they are beating like Chlamydomonas, then you find the antiphase state of the two cells, and its coupling falls off like one over length also. So that's what hydrodynamics should do, and it does. OK, but what's going on? How are we supposed to understand, then, the wild type which doesn't do this? Well, the answer is life is more complicated than simple bead spring models. So for instance, Ramin Golestanian at Oxford, shortly to be in Göttingen, as a director to Max Planck, uh, has done beautiful work where he said, look, why should I be so fixated on this idea that it's waveform compliance? What if I have a fixed orbit, but the force that's pushing me around this orbit varies with where I am? And that's clearly the case with the beating flagellum. So if you do that, you can actually get whatever you wish, depending upon how the forces vary. So you can get in-phase and anti-phase states the same way. And Leone and Liverpool, some years ago, suggested that this whole idea that, well, if it moves to a larger radius, it must slow down. Why, do, why is that the case? That's just our physicist perception of the simplest thing. But if it were the opposite, you could also get antiphase. So in some sense, I would say the jury is still out exactly what's going on in the real system. However, if you read the biological literature, you discover actually that we've been missing something all along, which is, as I alluded to before, inside the cell, these flagella are anchored in things called basal bodies, which are kind of like drums here. And these basal bodies actually play a very important role in cell division. You know, cells divide into two, but they also have two flagella. And it's the same two, because these things actually pull chromosomes apart during cell division. But in between them are filaments, very elaborate networks of filaments, depending upon the number of flagella. And th these have been known for years, and they're known even to respond to calcium and possibly even be contractile. So my postdoc, Kirsty Wan, did a systematic study of many of these mutants that have problems with their filaments, their internal filaments. And there's one particular mutant called VFL, variable flagellar number. So not only do they have no filaments connecting the basal bodies, but they might have three flagella, or five, or seven, all over their body. And the generic finding is that almost always there's no synchrony at all. But when there is synchrony, if you're really lucky and you find a triply flagellated cell like this, where two beat in one direction and one is oriented the other way, you can see that in the absence of the filamentary couplings, you get exactly what you expect from hydrodynamics. The two that are beating in the same direction are in phase synchronized, and the other guy is approximately anti phase. So Huygens was kind of right in the sense that, yeah, there's fluid mechanical coupling between the flagella, but it's a complex interplay of hydrodynamic coupling on the outside and elastic coupling on the inside, a bit like his elastic wall. OK, so to prove this one last time, you can do the following. You can discover that there are actually quadriflagellate species, single cell with four flagella, with a very complicated network of, of uh, filamentary connections. This is called tetracelmus. And you can gently come in with a pipette and hold this flagellum while the others are beating and see whether the beating waveforms are any different than when they were all four beating. And if fluid mechanical coupling were so vitally important to make this synchrony happen, then surely that would affect things. But it doesn't. You just delete the green, and there's almost no difference between the beating pattern uh, before and after. So it's clearly controlled in large part by the inside. OK, the last thing to say, the very last thing to say, is that remember I said that these are noisy dynamics, and this may remind you of something about 20 years ago, 
uh, a bunch of cardiologists and physicists in Boston were interested in the natural variability of the human heartbeat. So if I look at any of you with an electrocardiogram and I look at the inter-heartbeat interval, which is a bit stochastic, and I make a probability distribution of that, you'll discover that it actually has a long tail if you're healthy. And if it's very metronome-like and a very narrow distribution, then you should go to the A&E now. <laughs> and this is precisely the opposite of what the cardiologists always thought, because after all, we think of ourselves as sort of perfect machines, right? So the metronome is the right one, and the noisy one is the wrong, is the wrong one. That's totally wrong. It's exactly the opposite. Well, Clymenomonas has a heartbeat, in the sense, it's beating flagella. So we thought, what's the distribution of beating frequencies? Or in, what is the... Well, distribution of beating frequencies, and what are the, the nature of the correlations between those beating dynamics. So the first thing is, if you actually track over thousands of beats, you discover there is a reasonably broad distribution of beats, so it's, it's noisy. And it's not just fluctuations, uh, it's fluctuations in phase that are, are accumulated from the filamentary fluctuations. And if you look at the autocorrelation of the noise, you actually discover that it has a negative correlation even out to hundreds and hundreds of beats. And this time scale of sort of 500 beats is about the 10 seconds on which Clymenomonas switches from synchrony to asynchrony and back. So there's something interesting going on inside the cell, some kind of stochastic oscillator, which may play a role in these two processes. And even if you look at the individual limit cycle that these execute just beat to beat, you discover that the noise varies with where you are. So what does all of this mean? I've told you that we've got an interesting kind of stochastic hopping process here between periods of synchrony and asynchrony that have this effect of creating a motility that is a random walk. I didn't dwell on it a lot, but during these phase slips, the, the waveform and the frequency of beating are remarkably different than the wild type beating, and that's very much like this antiphase state of the, uh, of the mutant. And all of these things together suggest actually that this eukaryotic flagellum has distinct beats, distinct modes of motion, very much like a piano string has distinct harmonics. And this is a, something that's been emerging from a range of different theoretical ideas, most importantly from Frank Ulrich's group in Dresden, that we really have to think of this complex stochastic flagellum as a kind of nonlinear oscillator that ex exhibits hop bifurcations and things like that. What I've shown you suggests that there's some sort of noisy oscillator inside the cell we really don't understand a lot about it, but our current work is aimed at trying to tease out, perhaps by direct experimental visualization of calcium dynamics in the cell, how it's correlated with the beating. Okay, so I want you to understand that this work that I've described is something that's taken place over almost a decade now uh, with many, many collaborators, postdocs and students in my group, many faculty colleagues, including Tim in the room, uh, it really began uh, with a very long-standing collaboration that I had with John Kessler at the University of Arizona before I moved to Cambridge. And we're fortunate in Cambridge to have a, a, an amazing centrally funded staff of experimental technicians, electronics and uh, instrument manufacturing that underpins all the work that I've described. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, long-standing support from many agencies. Thank you. Should we pass these around, or? Uh, I could run. Yeah. <laughs> Any question? Does this work? Yes. Yeah. Or answers. I'll take answers. <laughs> perhaps then I will start, just perhaps to uh, ask. You, you mentioned uh, our patron saint. <laughs> And uh, you said it had an idea about, um, I think it was minimizing dissipation while this motion was happening. And then you went on to explain everything without it. Um, could it be that even so, in some sense, some dissipation or some energy loss in more general sense is minimized in your systems? I think it's quite possible, yes. Uh, in the end, as I said, it's often the case that you find in dynamical systems that it is minimizing dissipation, but you, you can't obtain the equations of motion by starting with some, something and, 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 and minimizing in any obvious way. Um, of course, you've got 
stochasticity, which means, which is a representation of injecting energy into the system. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a driven non-equilibrium system that's coming to a steady state, at least statistically, that perhaps is minimizing. Yeah. I assume perhaps, was like, I assume perhaps it's, uh, if, if what we are saying is true, perhaps it's difficult for you to actually test it in the laboratory. Yes. Yeah, yes. Why. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a long history of trying to optimize things, uh, that is, for theorists trying to optimize things in biology. Mm -hmm. And it has often given tremendous insight into these kinds of questions. But for instance, if you, if you look at the energy budget or the metabolic budget of flagellar action for bacteria, what fraction of their metabolic activity is spent swimming? It's only a few percent. So it's, it's hard to imagine that they would care about a few percent optimization on top of a few percent. But they might. Yeah. Any, yes? Must be a string theorist, I think. Well, first of all, <laughs> as, 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 as the string theorist, Yes. Um, I was pleased to see there was quite a lot of strings there. In oh, the yes, yes. I but um, <laughs> but I, what I was going to ask was at the beginning you said that the left-right symmetry was the last symmetry to break. So you, so, but uh, you didn't seem to go back to that topic. So I was wondering, you, so uh, you get these flagellum and they're, they're chiral, but what determined their chirality? So, yeah, yes. I mean... Right. Okay. Yeah, right. So... I, I can answer that specific question, but I should say the general question of exactly how the symmetry breaking happens is still under very active debate. I just reviewed a paper that basically was trying to compare uh, you know, all the different proposals because it sounds very simple to say you set up a chiral flow for reasons I'll explain in a moment and then something happens. But you know, it, why does a chiral flow distinguish this from that? I mean, it's going round and round, right? So there are all sorts of issues. Are the cilia releasing chemicals that are then being transported. Are they sensing the, flagella, the um, fluid flow by mechanical means? But the underlying proteins that make up the microtubules that make up the flagella are chiral. That is to say, they have chiral carbon molecules, the carbon atoms in them, and so they are chiral. And so there's only one type you find in biology. So you could say, yes, of course, really it's whatever cosmic processes led to the chiral proteins showing up that breaks the symmetry. But even if I just tell you it whirls round and round like this, it's just not obvious which way is left, which way is right. So it could have gone the other way and we'd still be confronted with this problem. But a good point, absolutely. And, and also it, it's important that they beat and they have to be tilted with respect to the plane. So they're actually beating like this. And that was a prediction actually that came out of a theoretical calculation that said, in order for this to make any sense, they better be tilted. And Idan Tuval, who was one of my postdocs in his PhD thesis elsewhere, said, well, they must be tilted. And the biologists went and discovered they must be tilted. But then why are they tilted? Yeah, it keeps going. Another question for Ray? Well, the big challenge, the big challenge, as I said uh, right at the end, was if we believe that calcium dynamics play a role in, in, in all of this, we'd love to be able to visualize in real time fluctuating calcium concentrations in the cell and correlate that with what happens in the beating dynamics. Now, there are well-known calcium sensitive dyes that can be put in or reporters for calcium presentation, uh, presence uh, in the cell. The problem is intensity. We have to visualize this at thousands of frames a second. And you just can't get fluorescent molecules to give up enough light without frying the cells. Uh, and so we're, we're a little bit stuck trying to make that happen. Um, so that's an example of something where the, the technology is, is just not there to actually see what we really need to see. But there can be clever things that you can do. For instance, uh, maybe just slowing everything down by higher viscosity or engineering something about the molecular motors would reduce the need for such high-speed imaging and allow us to see what's going on uh, at video rates, in which case then it becomes much easier. Uh, the other thing is, of course, it's very difficult to see, as, although we can track in three dimensions the swimming, we can't simultaneously see the flagellar motion because we're 
with insufficient res resolution to have the field of view we need. So there's this tension between seeing what the flagella are doing and seeing what the cells are doing freely. Uh, there's some holographic techniques that might be useful. Um, and the other thing, of course, is if you take advantage of these species, which get larger and larger and larger, you can content yourself with studying what happens with the larger ones, like gonium, which is this plate-like structure. We just, a few days ago, got the first images, the videos of them doing phototaxis. So it's a little plate that swims with eight flagella, eight flagellated cells on the outside that turn it, and uh, eight in the center that push it. And so it's a little swimming plate that can turn and steer. And now we're trying to figure out how that works. But it's big. You know how to do this? Uh, yeah, well, um, there we go. Right. yeah, I was um, asked to give this vote of thanks as one of the people still alive who um, knew James Lighthill. Uh, better than almost anybody else. Um, and I was asked to say a few words, not, not just giving a vote of thanks to Ray. Incidentally, I always think this is a very strange <laughs> phrase, giving a vote of thanks. Um, I mean, I will vote you know, positively, uh, and I'm sure, uh, but, but you don't ever get the chairman saying, and those against. Yeah. But of course, there wouldn't be any. That's the, the reason. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. So I'll say a few things about Light Hill. Um, it may be it may be said that the uh, the great the two greatest fluid dynamicists of the 20th century were G. I. Taylor in the first half. Uh, and James Lighthill in the second half. Actually, Lighthill himself um, used to say that in his view, Ludwig Prantl, the discoverer of boundary layer theory, uh, and the, the man who started the great group at Göttingen, um, was greater than G.I. Taylor. But I think he only said that in order to annoy George Batchelor. So we can uh, <coughs> forget about it. Now, the, the thing is, as uh, Ray has pointed out, um, that the work of G.I. Taylor and James Lighthill overlapped in the very early 1950s because they both studied, they were the two people who first looked at the hydrodynamics of low random number swimming. G.I. Taylor with his, um, with his uh, waving sheets and James Lighthill uh, with his squirmers. Uh, the... Um, the title of James's uh, uh, paper, published in 1952, on the squirming motion of nearly spherical deformable bodies through liquids at very small Reynolds numbers, there's a temptation which I'm trying to resist to try and sound like Lytle saying that, because the word squirming is very Lytle. Uh, um, anyway, that, was, that and GIs were the beginning of this uh, theoretical hydrodynamics. Um, the Lighthill's work was followed up by his, by the way, K, Lighthill was at Manchester. I shouldn't be pointing at that, should I? Uh, Lighthill was at Manchester um, at that time, throughout the 1950s. Uh, and, uh, but he, uh, the next follow-up on the squirming model was done by Lighthill's student, John Blake, who sadly died last year, um, in the early 1970s. <coughs> Um, and has followed up, uh, actually, also in a paper last year by Ray Goldstein and myself and our student, Doug Brumney. Um, uh, but James, in his Manchester, in his early Manchester days, Lighthill did have another student who worked on low Reynolds number swimming um, and got his PhD in 1953, called Jeff Hancock, um, who, and he pioneered the analysis of flagella hydrodynamics uh, using so-called resistive force theory and slender body theory after that. Uh, but of course, in those days, um, supervisors did not add their names to papers published by their students. So um, the ideas behind Hancock's work were not uh, immediately 
um, credited to Lighthill, though they should have been. Um, in the 1950s, Lighthill made remarkable advances in many topics in fluid mechanics. Uh, supersonic aerodynamics, aeroacoustics, boundary layer theory, nonlinear waves, and his next contribution in biological fluid dynamics was not until 1960 uh, with his JFM paper called Note on the Swimming of Slender Fish, um, in which he introduced reactive force theory rather than resistive force theory uh, for high Reynolds number swimming. This is a 12-page paper, and it is absolutely remarkable. It's all there. In the 1970s, he and many students and postdocs did work, extended it further, doing lots and lots more details on the swimming of fish. But all the basic ideas were already in, in this 12-page paper, which was, uh, which was remarkable. In fact, one of my favorite slides from the Light Hills Fishy Years as it were, is this one uh, demonstrating convergent evolution of the lunate crescent-shaped tail of swimming fish. The top six are bony fish. The next two are cartilaginous fish, which have totally different evolutionary uh, um, history. Uh, mammals, cetaceans, and an extinct ichthyosaur. Uh, which, is, which is remarkable. Now, I came to Imperial College on a sort of uh, second postdoctoral uh, position with James Lighthill in 1968 when he was a Royal Society Research Professor uh, here um, with a suite of offices on, I think, the seventh floor of the Mechanical Engineering Department. Uh, so I had a desk up there. Uh, <clears throat> but the year before... He had been instrumental in creating the Physiological Flow Studies Unit um, under the direction of Colin Caro. And I'm totally delighted to see that Colin is here today uh, and uh, continuing the tradition of um, hard work that he had all of us uh, uh, <coughs> following. And that was located in the aeronautics department. Uh, along the corridor where Christos has his office now. Um, and that was an interesting uh, uh, historical fact. Uh, the, the PFSU, as it was called, later merged with something called the Engineering and Medicine Laboratory from the Electrical Engineering Department uh, to form the Center for Biological and Medical Systems. And it was accorded the title of a department, the Department of, Bi of Bioengineering, in 2001. And when Lighthill went on to Cambridge in 1969 as Lucasian Professor of Mathematics, um, I uh, stayed at Imperial, transferred to a joint lectureship. It was called a lectureship, but it was on soft money, uh, jointly between mathematics and the PFSU. And I've been working on biological fluid mechanics ever since. Anyway, I should, I should turn to, to Ray Goldstein. Um, now, along with the great fluid dynamicists, uh, Taylor and Lighthill, uh, Ray's work is, uh, uh, features um, extraordinarily uh, innovative uh, physical insight and mathematical modeling. But like Taylor and unlike Lighthill, uh, it's coupled tightly to experiment. And applied mathematics is actually not much use if it isn't coupled to experiment. Of course, James Lighthill would, uh, would say that he was, he, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, as director of the Royal Aircraft Establishment for the second half of the 1950s, uh, or the beginning of the 1960s, I should say, um, he had lots of experiments to base his work on. He, he was amazing. But Ray does these fantastic experiments and, uh, and to my mind one of the most notable examples which he's told us about is um, uh, the fact that diffusion alone is not adequate uh, to provide nutrient uptake for the, these um, 
uh, vulvous caline uh, algae um, where, uh, when their size exceeds some critical size. Um, and above a critical size, uh, they the, the concentration boundary layer has to be thin enough for, um, for the nutrients to be taken up in sufficient quantities um, because the demand is proportional to the square of the radius and if it's just diffusion, uh, the supply is proportional to the radius. Um, and uh, so in the, 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 it's only the bigger ones that can actually work properly. And this led, we think, uh, he was very judicious about not saying it's certainly the case, but it seems to be pretty certain to me, um, that uh, it's, um, he explained the argument that the evolution of multicellularity uh, and, and the... Um, Different, the evolution of different cell types is a consequence of this physical process. So like the development of the lunate tail in fish, this is a perfect example of natural selection taking place under the constraints provided by the laws of physics, uh, which uh, all biologists should remember uh, exist, the laws of physics, that is. Um, and all fluid dynamicists should remember that biology is more complicated than they think which is why trying to argue that things happen optimally, although very seductive, is uh, a difficult basis for making biological advances because nobody knows what the organisms are trying to optimize. Um, so I think this, was, this, this area in particular is one where Ray has made enormous contributions to biological thinking. Now the breadth and uh, clarity of Ray's uh, outstanding exposition of these, his highly original research and that of his excellent group uh, of mostly, mostly young colleagues uh, are remarkable as you will agree and you will have been listening to. So I hope you will join me in thanking him most warmly for his superb Light Hill Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.